This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. I'm your host, Lores, and today we're going to be discussing the 1986 crime drama, River's Edge. You giving my friend trouble? Listen, I cannot sell you guys beer after 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, I'm here to turn back the time. Matt, take your beer and leave. Look, John, it's Do it! it. So, as I stated before, River's Edge is a 1980s teen crime drama starring Crispin Glover, Keanu Reeves, Dennis Hopper, and Daniel Roebuck. Released in 1987, nearly a year after its premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival, River's Edge was a low-key hit with critics, but had divided audiences upon its release. It came at the intersection of a time period in film where the focus of cinema goers was beginning to shift from blockbusters of the era like Indiana Jones and Batman to those active within the independent film movement. It was not fully uh, crystallized just yet, but it was becoming slowly recognized as a wave. And this occurred sometime around the release of Steven Soderbergh's Sex, Lies, and a Videotape in 1989, and then later in the mainline pop culture with Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs in 92 and Pulp Fiction in 1995. So River's Edge landed at a peculiar time. With its premiere, the film's biggest star was Crispin Glover, who had been dancing with a potential industry blacklisting following a poorly staged character debut on David Letterman to promote the film, and also a then-unreleased feature titled Reuben and Ed, which wouldn't see its way out to the masses for maybe five or six years after the fact. Now starring in a motion picture called River's Edge, folks, please welcome Crispin Glover. Are things going all right this summer? I'm having a very good, good summer. Yeah. Where do you live now? You live in Los Angeles? Yes, that's right. In Los Angeles, uh -huh. I just bought a nice condominium. Condominium? Where, where's it located? It's located just over the hill in the valley, and I'm really happy about it. Did you... Uh, did for a time you lived in Hollywood? You lived on Hollywood Boulevard? Big tower on Hollywood? No. No. I... I... I knew that this was going to happen, and I, uh... <laughs> I, can I tell you, because the, the press, they can do things. They can twist things around, and... Because... The, you're talking... I don't... Look, I... The press says things about you in 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 the in the paper. This is a a paper, the L.A. Weekly in in Los Angeles, and they said they said about me a lot. La di da. It was at a, I went to a club, and they said that um, it was at a meeting, and it said Crispin Glover, who was in a frenzy, though his bark is w actually worse than his dot dot dot. You get the point. Mm -hmm. And. Welcome back to the show. We're running a little uh, short of time tonight. I would have loved to have chatted more with Crispin Glover, but I understand he had a cab to catch, and well... It was uh, an interesting segment. Yeah. Uh... I think that's the first time that we've been doing the show that a, a guest actually tried to kick me. Well, I think it was a conceptual piece. Uh, uh, well, he came very close to denting my head with those, yes. giant, with those giant shoes, so I thought... I don't need that. I'm, I'm 40. I went to college. I've had a number of... I don't need... This, that is not how I want my life ended. Some goofball, some dork from uh, wherever. Oh, stop it. Stop it. This is in addition to making waves with Steven Spielberg and Amblin by refusing to appear in the sequel to Back to the Future and also having caused an enormous amount of trouble on the set of that original film. Dennis Hopper was the second biggest name attached, but during this time, he was still in movie jail. Hopper was blacklisted from the industry following the failure of his troubled, unfocused, and expensive directorial effort, The Last Movie, in 1971. Though it's unclear as to whether it was that, or the fact that he had garnered a reputation over the course of the BBS era for being difficult to work with, a result of ego and excessive drug use. You know, there's also documented disappearances of Dennis Hopper where he just goes into the forest or he goes into the wild for a, an undisclosed period of time and then just shows back up. And this is while they're shooting movies, too. So definitely not the kind of guy you would want to work with uh, back then where your you, you know, celluloid is money. So in addition to all of that, 
The then unknown Keanu Reeves was just another face to pad out the teen cast, many of whom wouldn't garner an eighth of the careers that the previously named three would. Set at a budget of a measly $1.7 million, the plot of River's Edge is simple. John, played by Daniel Roebuck, who could pass as John Candy's evil twin here, kills Jamie, his much thinner and prettier girlfriend. It's unclear as to how a large oaf who always looks sad and lacks any charisma at all manages to net a girl who would probably typically play a bitchy cheerleader in a made-for-TV movie. Maybe she's got some weird thing where he vaguely looks like her abusive stepfather and has issues to work out, like a good 30% of young women these days due to Tumblr.com. But the point is, she's dead and John killed her. This sends ripples through John and Jamie's friend circle, consisting of Lane, Crispin Glover, Matt, Keanu Reeves, Clarissa, Say Anything's I Own Sky, and Maggie, Roxana Zal, who has not made much of her career since. The result is an acting canvas for the likes of Crispin Glover and Dennis Hopper, and it's hard to tell at times if they're taking the material seriously or not. There are good chunks of this movie that feel as if it could exist within the same world as Twin Peaks. There's always this weird, heightened sense of reality, and the characters are over the top, yet still manage to feel real. Dennis Hopper's character in this movie is maybe the prime example of that. You could interchange him with any given character living in Twin Peaks, but uh, Hopper at this time was coming off of principal photography for Blue Velvet, Lynch's third choice behind Michael Ironside and Harry Dean Stanton to play the now iconic role of Frank Booth in that film, and it had yet to be released, meaning that Hopper was still in the tank. The character he plays in River's Edge that of the gun-toting, blow-up doll-loving feck, for better or worse, screams washed-up actor, and was seemingly designed, or at least retrofitted, fitted, excuse me, with Hopper in mind. Feck, as he is introduced to us, is essentially Frank Booth, but without the violent streak or penchant for sexual abuse. Rather than huffing oxygen and wearing lipstick, Feck prefers igniting friendships with minors throughout distribution of free marijuana and bragging about having shot a woman. There are repeated references to his past as a biker, and there's even an Easy Rider name check earlier in the film, looking to call back Harper's glory years and find a sense of respect toward his career, which, as principal photography took place, had yet to be realized and earned. Hopper is predictably hammy as feck, but knows when to pull it back, being a veteran actor and all, which cannot be stated for Crispin Glover as Lane. Crispin Glover's performance in River's Edge can be summed up to a single word. Terrible. At no point does Glover choose to rein his performance in and play it subtle. However, it is because of this that his performance is so memorable, and ultimately that elevates the film out of the shadows and into the territory uh, of perhaps cult classic, though I do refrain from using that term to describe this movie, if only because it managed to triple its budget at the box office and was critically well received upon its release. It's the kind of effect that uh, occurs when you sit down and watch Friday the 13th, the final chapter, where Crispin Glover, his character is a normal guy. He's your average Joe. But then you turn on some music and he's got these dance moves you've never seen before, and he's a total freak, he's a weirdo, but it's the most memorable part of that movie. And probably one of the reasons why people tend to revisit that, in addition to you know, having a, uh, a, a, a weird bubble-headed Corey Feldman hacking up Jason Voorhees at the end of the film. But back to River's Edge. I, I, I don't feel comfortable calling this movie a cult classic, if only because it did gain that recognition and it distinguished itself uh, during its time period. However... With time, River's Edge has been forgotten, unlike its spiritual predecessor, Blue Velvet, which has only garnered more praise as the years have passed. That could be simply because River's Edge is not as good or coherent of a movie as Blue Velvet, or it could be that the director, Tim Hunter, failed to muster much of a career in cinema following the movie's release. He has, appropriately enough, gone on to direct episodes of television shows such as Twin Peaks, American Horror Story, Pretty Little Liars, and Riverdale. Typically, when a film director ventures into procedural television, it's something to be frowned upon. And I agree with this notion. 
It's a sign that the filmmaker has not only lost his spark, but likely his will to live. It's not a craft anymore, it's a job. You're getting a paycheck each week, so Gus Grant, or whatever his, whatever his name is on The Flash, says this and that correctly, and it comes across as something watchable to a 12-year-old boy or girl. You know, Kevin Smith might be the prime example of that kind of director, retreating to the likes of CW superhero programs after the failure of his True North trilogy with its second installment, Yoga Hosers. Now he's going to finish it by making money off of Supergirl and using trauma to produce that feature. At least John Carpenter had the self-respect to admit he'd lost his touch and bowed out only eight films after exiting his prime. Looking back at the era of filmmaking that this movie was birthed in, and the adult teen film genre that was so popular then and is virtually non-existent now, River's Edge falls somewhere between the likes of Cameron Crowe's Fast Times at Ridgemont High and Francis Ford Coppola's Rumblefish. But unlike those two films, there was something in River's Edge that felt authentic. There was an aspect of heightened reality, as I had mentioned before, that felt truer to our own, which didn't quite didn't quite match with Fast Times at Ridgemont High, even though the experiences the characters felt in that movie seemed realistic. They were all just a bit too cookie-cutter. They were a little two-dimensional. Uh, and with Rumblefish, you know, everything about that movie feels kind of like The Outsiders, the book. The characters in River's Edge were ridiculous, but also familiar, and in spite of their camp nature, they took themselves seriously. If this movie were to be made today, the audience would be in on the joke along with the characters, because after all, it is just a movie. But here, in spite of their colorful nature, there are very real consequences for each of the major players involved. There are very real consequences for each of the major players involved. John may, as previously stated, be an oaf, but he's also a killer, and he enjoyed murdering his girlfriend. Lane is over the top, he's cartoonish, but he is also complicit in aiding John to cover up the death of his girlfriend. Matt may be your typical dopey late 80s, early 90s Keanu Reeves character, but he has a lot to reckon with, with the decay of his friend circle and the corruption of his younger brother's spirit. That being said, if you're a listener of this show, it goes without saying at this point, but the probability of a film like River's Age being made inside the system today is nil. It would simply not happen, or at the very least, carry the same impact as it did when it was made in 1986. Hell, the probability of it being made inside the system even then was fairly low, and took the now-defunct English studio Hamdale Communications to push it into production. You would have driven right past us we had to yell something. You yelled at me. I've got a name, you know. You're lucky I didn't just drive right home. Okay, 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 I'm sorry, Clarissa. But you've got to understand that in a time like this where every fucking second counts, a man can't waste his time choosing words. There is a question that needs to be addressed, and it's something that was mulled over with Jerry Jensen, who has a name like a Marvel superhero, Jerry Jensen, Daily Bugle. Jerry Jensen, who I had on the show three weeks ago, to discuss the 2019 film Lords of Chaos and the black metal scene that surrounded it, full of treacherous foes that you would never probably want to encounter in your day-to-day -day existence. Uh, is there a place for outsider art inside the main line of an industry? The answer that we are beginning to come to is no. No, there is not. There was a 30 to 40 year flirtation that peaked in the 70s and ran dry in the arts, but even that had been properly measured by the heads of studios and allocated in proportions related to risk and budget. Well, the budgets no longer allow for risk. River's Edge is a movie about kids who listen to punk and metal, they drink, they smoke, they do drugs, they break the law and murder, all in a time of heated panic regarding morality in relation to art and how it was affecting the youth. On top of that, the most marketable actor involved had rendered their name essentially useless due to public battles of drug and alcohol abuse. This is a man who, for a period of time, could only find work through his more daring friends like Coppola and by relocating to a different continent. Logistically, River's Edge is more likely to be made today, though with less of a budget, a higher chance of controversy, 
and a slimmer window of theatrical distribution. But is that a bad thing? Did you love her? Did you hate her? Did you fuck her when you got bored? She was a friend, I guess. What do you mean, you guess? Either she was or she wasn't. She was. So you're standing there, staring at your dead friend like it's all some kind of a big joke, right? Some adventure. What the hell was going on in your head, man, huh? Exactly what? What were you thinking about? Or were you even thinking at the time? Answer me, God damn it! I don't know, okay? You want me to make something up? You just stay around here to fuck my mother and eat her food. Matt! Is it a bad thing? Or is it adjusting to the times that you are in? Mean Creek was a film that was similar in nature, released in 2004 starring Josh Peck, that premiered at Sundance and screened at Cannes. It received glowing reviews and is perhaps the one good performance of Peck's Nickelodeon-stained career. It was shot on a budget of a half million dollars and due to its critical success was purchased by Paramount Classics. Wouldn't that be exciting if you're an independent filmmaker, you just shot this cheap movie with the star of Drake and Josh and all of a sudden Paramount decides, you know what, we're going to take a chance on you, we're going to put that movie out. You know, it, it, was a, it was a studio that prided itself on, on picking up these weird niche films that maybe no one else would have saw otherwise. And what they did with Mean Creek was they effectively buried it. They put it out in four theaters domestically. Nobody saw this movie. Mean Creek would end its box office run grossing only $300,000 more than its budget worldwide. And you can look at that as an outright failure, or if you want to think in terms of money, it's a success given that the limited run was only four theaters and it did manage to make all of that money within that time. Uh, and it had a non-existent marketing campaign. So there is something to be said about it, but on the whole, a lot more could have been done with this movie. Paramount Classics would later rebrand as Paramount Vantage, and they, they really did put out some great movies under that, under that namesake. But the result was the company died shortly thereafter doing that rebranding uh, due to unsustainable returns on features released. So clearly something was not working here. The point of this story is 15 years ago, the studios released these movies and didn't even really know how to. Even after the independent renaissance of the 90s that spawned several great directors and successful films, the idea of selling a small budgeted movie to U.S. audiences was considered alien, and it bankrupted corporations. Eventually, they hit a point where they just had to stop. And that's why you see such a difference now in movies released in theaters today than, say, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. It's a very different landscape. But each of the major creative industries has undergone a dramatic change over the past 20-some-odd years as a direct result of the digital era. The first was the music industry with the birth of Napster, and we saw how Metallica did trying to fight that. You know, obviously, it's the whole Obi-Wan Kenobi thing where you strike me down, I'll become more powerful. Well, a bunch of Napster uh, companies, uh, Napster-esque companies, rather, sprung up immediately and copied the formula, and now you can get anything for free online. For now, anyway. Then the, the literature, the field of literature, was hit next with the rise of ebooks and self-publishing and now we're here homegrown film studios that due to creative ideological or budgetary reasons cannot coalesce with hollywood are slowly rising now one after another and over the coming years the the movies that feel the least synthetic to you or strike the greatest emotional chord may not have the most recognizable or culturally relevant faces particularly impressive effects or even theatrical distribution, but they will exist in some form. The ability to make a movie like River's Edge is now in the hands of anyone who wants to make that movie. That doesn't mean that it's going to be good or even well executed, but there's a greater chance for it to exist, with or without the approval of gatekeepers. We are in the midst of a purity spiral, and that can be interpreted in any number of ways. The priorities of the culture currently are not the same as they were 10 years ago, and likely will not be the same 10 years from now. And there's, I cannot stress this enough, but the meat of the entertainment industry is tender now. 
and it may not be so later. It is entirely possible that there will never be a better time to pursue your most ambitious ideas and goals than right this moment. And so, to cap this episode off, River's Edge is a very good, very fun movie, and in the modern era of film, a more overlooked classic of the 1980s. We definitely need more like this, and the ability to propagate that is on any filmmaker listening to this podcast right now.